Patrick Parker, welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Thanks for having me, John. Excited to be here. It is a pleasure to be with you today. You're joining us from the Nashville area. I'm south of Salt Lake City in Utah. And today we're going to be talking about one of my favorite topics, and that is leadership and how to create a successful team. Some of the, we'll, we'll be exploring some of the ins and outs of the various techniques and approaches that we can take to create a psychologically safe organizational and team environment where everyone can bring their whole authentic self into the workplace, be who they are, contribute in meaningful ways, and add value to the team and to the organization. As we get started, I wanted to share Patrick's bio with everybody. Patrick B. Parker is an accomplished tech executive turned founder with domestic and international experience in operations, custom software development, multi-channel product distribution, and marketing involving both startup and growth operations. He has bootstrapped companies he founded to millions in ARR and has raised venture capital to build out teams, refine product features and user experiences and, ex and execute go-to market strategies. Patrick has built award-winning products and led major growth initiatives in both the public and private sectors. He is a proven operation strategist with a track record of building successful businesses. And you can find out more about him. Uh, we'll give him an opportunity to share all of that with you here in just a minute. Uh, Patrick, anything else you would like to share with listeners by way of your background or personal context before we really dive on into the conversation? No, John, hearing it again, I just, it's quite a mouthful. I really got to work on shortening that up, don't I? <laughs> no, it's great. You, you've done a lot of really great stuff. You bring all of that experience to this conversation, uh, which is wonderful. And I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to share uh, your insights, your experience, and your wisdom with me and my listeners. Now, I have to, I, I'm, I'm not sure how much you want to go there, but in the pre-interview, we were just chatting and you were talking about, you know, how your story around how you ended up in Nashville was interesting and unique. Um, and I, I have a suspicion that it might play into our, uh, our conversation today and how you've gone about your career. So if you wouldn't mind just taking a few minutes and, and sharing a little bit about that story, that backstory, as I think that can inform how we uh, carry out this conversation together today. Whew, we're going to get deep from the, from the jump, huh? Um, no. So I, uh, my, my wife and I, uh, 13 years ago, a little bit over, um, had a daughter, uh, special needs, ended up being born with a, a brain tumor and living in Nashville and, and being involved in the, the tech scene at that time. Um, Nashville, Tennessee, uh, in general, doesn't provide uh, the same type of, of Medicaid and medical services that uh, that Kentucky does, which is how we ultimately uh, ended up here. So in, in Tennessee, it's income based. And uh, in Kentucky, it's needs based. So the daughter was born at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Uh, and then after that, we were uh, transitioned for continuing care to uh, children's uh, Cincinnati Children's. And uh, so instead of making the drive and, and going without the services we need, we ended up relocating and uh, ended up uh, working here in the Commonwealth for uh, quite a few years, uh, doing uh, a lot of work for uh, the Commonwealth of Kentucky, contracting with state government, building out large health tech systems. Uh, and eventually got got tired of, of the whole big four consulting uh, scene and <clears throat> decided to strike out and, and do my own thing. And I've been doing that uh, ever since and, and have a lot of success uh, in, in scaling it. So let's thank see you. And I, yeah, I know we could go into much more depth, but I appreciate that. I appreciate you sharing that. Um, I think we all have our unique backstories that that fill out the context around our careers and a lot of these decisions and choices that we make at various points in our lives definitely influence the trajectory and the momentum that we're on and, and can put us in completely different spaces than we may have ever thought that we would be in. Um, and I'm, I'm guessing that your wife and you did yeah. not um, assume or consider even that you would end up in Nashville um, prior to the challenges with your child, um, but ultimately, life is funny that way that it just takes us in different places and and uh, you make the most out of the opportunities that are presented to you um and you know dealing with a child with with cancer i can't even imagine uh, so my deepest heartfelt uh condolences to that experience um uh, but you, you learn and grow from it as well and that feeds into how you carry out your career so i think that's tremendous 
Absolutely. Yeah. It's, uh, it definitely helps with the why that's for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Helps with the why. And, you know, that's actually a great segue into what the, the main topic of the conversation today is going to be, um, as leaders and you've, you've been an experienced leader and executive, you've, you've built companies, you've ran teams, uh, everyone has to have their, that why you have to, you know, uh, Simon Sinek talks about the why of work, um, whether you frame it that way specifically, or you just, you ha- you're grounded in w- what you want to accomplish in life and what matters most. You have your priorities straight, you have your values straight, and then you try to carry that out into, uh, the workplace. Right. And, and that's going to, when, when you have that, why, when you have that clear, that clarity around what your purpose is, then you just, you do better stuff. You create better stuff. You add more value to the market. Uh, and that's what you've been able to do during your career. So with all of that as the foundation, let's talk about now some of those, the, the mindsets, the techniques, the approaches um, that you can take as a leader. So you sure. can start to create these dynamic, successful teams that will in a sustainable way, continue to add value to the market. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think the biggest thing, and you, you kind of touched on this is, is having extreme clarity on your why and on what those core values are. It, it helps to align, not just your vision, but the organization as a whole. And I, it just makes everything easier. Uh, it's easier to, to focus and to understand expectations when you're clear on the why, you're clear on the, the how, and you're clear on, um, you know, what, what you're looking to deliver, right? So I think that's, uh, that's a big thing. You know, when we started this company, uh, myself and my partners, we were extremely clear on what the objective was. Um, you know, that mission has, has changed as we've continued to grow and evolve and, and had the means to make a bigger impact uh, in more lives. But the foundation is, is still the same, right? We're still built on honesty, integrity, and, and transparency. And I think that's something that, that resonates with our customers as well and something that they love about working with us. Um, it also is extremely important in helping to build out the culture um, of our company. Uh, and to to maintain that company as we continue to to grow and scale, and again, it all starts at the top, and it all starts with with the people that you you hire subsequently, and so I think we've just done a, a really good job of of communicating what our values are, what our competencies are, uh, and the best way that we can serve people, and then from there, you know, everything else just kind of falls into place, or at least it has uh, has for us. But <clears throat> we uh, we run things a little bit differently uh, here at SaaS Partners, so. You know, where you have a lot of traditional custom software shops working to build products for customers, uh, we do that. But in addition to that, we operate under what's known as a studio model. And in a studio model, when we have developers roll off of uh, projects when they're working with clients, they turn around and until the next project picks up, they will start developing products or continue developing products uh, in-house that we will ultimately take to market. And so... It's, uh, it's a little bit different than your, your traditional model, wherein uh, it's just focused on client delivery. Here, we, uh, every time we, we create a new product, we want to take the market, we stand up a new company. And that gives a lot of opportunity for those developers, for our salespeople, for our marketing staff uh, to step up and to take on new roles and responsibilities and basically just have uh, a pathway to unlimited growth. Uh, we have people that have come in here as, as salespeople that have moved up to uh, VPs, uh, been managers, uh, and then have, have ultimately helped, uh, co-found companies. So it's, uh, it's incredible, um, that we've had the amount of success that we have, uh, but it also helps with retention rates. So in the last five years, since we've started, we have a 97% retention rate, uh, especially with the pandemic and everything else that is, has kind of gone on the great resignation, uh, as a lot are calling it. Um, and the, the great reset, um, to be able to, to retain people at the level that we have is, is absolutely incredible. And that's, it's so critical, uh, for a growing organization specifically because you're able to retain all of that institutional knowledge, all of that operational knowledge. Uh, and then you're able to, to really, uh, continue scaling up that, that culture and scaling it out. So I think that's something that we've been very fortunate with, uh, just in the way that, that we build things out. 97% retention uh that is incredible 
Uh, yes. Congratulations on that. Um, that alone, you. you know, just from from a pure dollars and cents perspective, that's tremendous because it's saving you so much in related costs to turnover. Um, you know, that company, so many companies have had to deal with, and just lost productivity to having open positions and and burnout from other employees having to pick up the slack of other people leaving. Like, there's so many things um, sure. that are impacted when people leave. And so, that, so having a good retention rate is fantastic, and it, it, it's indicative of uh, a lot of the things that you're trying to do. Uh, because people right now have choices. People aren't sticking around because they have nothing better that they can go after. They're sticking around because it's a place where they have meaning and purpose in the work that they do. That they're, they're they derive that meaning. They're able to make a meaningful contribution. They're able to develop themselves. They're able to um, uh, continually learn and grow. You know, all it's a safe culture. It's a dynamic culture. All of those things are the reasons why people stay. When those things don't exist, people leave. Even if you pay them pretty well, people will leave when those components I just mentioned aren't there. Um, so you're obviously doing a lot of things right. Yeah, absolutely. And it's so interesting because <clears throat> we, we are very intentional in pouring into our people, into skilling them up, into providing training and providing opportunities to, to grow and advance. Uh, but I think the biggest thing is we also give them room to fail, right? In fact, we actually encourage it. So being a, a software development company, being in tech, innovation happens at such a rapid pace. And if you're not trying new things, if you're not experimenting, if you're not failing, then you're not learning. Right. You're not you're not you're not discovering anything new. You're not uh, you're not on the, the bleeding edge. And that's something that we really push on our people here. And so they also feel safe. They know that, hey, if I make a mistake, if I screw up, if I try something out and it doesn't work out, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to be uh, trying to find a new job. And so I, I think that's yeah. something else that people really love about the, the way that we run things. Uh, and I think that's that's such a big piece of, of the culture here. Yeah. And that's, that's huge. And now, of course, nobody wants to fail. Nobody wants to sure. lose money, um, you know, yeah. through failed initiatives, but what you're describing is not just being complacent and accepting um, bad performance and failure. You're describing a growth culture and a growth mindset within your organization. You're describing an innovative, an innovation approach and mindset. And that can only happen as people feel safe to learn and grow, which means quote unquote failure or just yep. things not working, right? That's how it always works when we're learning and growing and you're stretching. And like you said, bleeding edge. If you want to be bleeding edge, guess what? Not everything is going to work. That's right. <laughs> but That's but right. when it doesn't work, you 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 iterate and you try new things and you experiment and you you learn from what didn't work and you do something better the next time. And when people feel safe to be able to do that, it's empowering, it's 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 energizing. Um, and then people aren't going to, you know, retreat to kind of doing the bare minimum to just stay safe and to get by, but they're going to push the envelope and they're going to try new things. And that's what you need in a high tech, innovative kind of marketplace. That's it. That's it. And I mean, I, I always, I always tell my employees and, and tell our clients and everyone else. I mean, the biggest thing with entrepreneurship is that it's, it's not an exact science, right? You can use all the, the frameworks, all the playbooks, all the, uh, the experience from the gurus and everyone else. But the, at the end of the day, you're going to have to go through those periods of trial and error, right? And, and some of the greatest lessons that I ever learned in my entire life came from my failures, right? I've, I've probably, I would, I would venture to guess that I have probably learned more from my failures than I ever have from my excesses, my successes. And so I, I think that's the thing where, you know, we try to, to propel that forward into our culture. And I think that that's something that, that resonates with people and that they really enjoy uh, uh, trying new things. They understand that there's, there's more than one way to do things. Um, and that more than anything, consumer behavior changes so rapidly that in order to find that intersection of, of where they are and where they're going and to hit that moving target, you're going to have to try things. Um, and you're going to have to try a lot of things and you're going you're to fail. But again, it's the, the failure is acceptable. The not learning from the failure, right? That's when you have a, a problem. And so that's what we just try to monitor right. and provide accountability around. Yeah, perfect, perfect. Good. So creating that psychologically safe environment is key. You've already talked quite a bit about that. That's fantastic. What other approaches, techniques, frameworks, mindsets have you found to be beneficial and you know helpful as you're trying to create dynamic, successful teams? Sure. 
I think it's, um, <clears throat> we, we go above and beyond just during the, the hiring process, right? Just trying to understand uh, not only what skills that they have in terms of, of can the person actually do the job, uh, but we're looking more at the mentality, the mindset. Does this person have a growth mindset? Is this person competitive? We love competitive people because we compete here. Um, and I think that's extremely important as well. We want to work with people that are, are looking to better themselves. They're looking to improve. Uh, they're looking to try new things. And I, I think that is uh, paramount in, in the type of people that we actually have employed here. And I think that's what contributes so much to the culture, right? Because especially as you continue to, to scale out uh, and to, to onboard new employees, um, each different person that joins your organization is going to bring something new, right? They're going to bring a new dimension. They're going to bring a new element. They're going to bring uh, new likes to dislikes. It could be taste in music. It could be any number of things, right? What, uh, what sports, what things that they enjoy outside of the office, right? But all those things contribute subtly um, and, and are going to comprise your overall culture. So, so we want people that are like-minded. Uh, we do a great job of pairing people up with mentors when they first get here. And we get uh, very deep in terms of walking through what uh, the progression will look like with us, right? So if we have people on our sales organization side coming in as, as SDRs, transitioning to, to account execs, moving up to uh, managers, moving up to VPs, moving up, you know, things of that nature, we have a very clear progression of how we run things. Uh, and then everything else is, is focused around how can we help skill this person up? How can we train this person to get to the next level? Right. Because the more training that we can provide, the more knowledge transfer and the more hands on experience that we can provide, the better those people are going to do uh, when actually going out and, and working with clients. And so I think that's something that uh, we have a major emphasis on. And because of that, uh, it literally permeates throughout every single corner of our organization. Right. And that's the stuff where, especially as we're launching these new products, we need to have people that we can trust uh, to go out to take these to market. Uh, to start building out the same uh, functional domains that we have in our organization. And basically, we're looking to replicate that culture uh, and those processes across those different companies that we're creating. And so it, it becomes very, very critical that, that we do an incredible job of onboarding, of skilling, retooling, training, et cetera, uh, so that we can continue to, to launch new ventures, uh, not only for our clients, but, but for ourselves as well. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. All of that, I think is, is hugely, hugely important. And again, it, it makes sense why your retention rate would be so high when you have mm -hmm. that kind of an environment. This is the kind of environment where people really get excited to get up in the morning, pull themselves yeah. out of bed and get to work. Even if it's super cold outside, even if it's dark, yeah. and you want to just stay curled up in bed, but you're excited to get to work because you know, you're part of something. Um, and it's, it's lively, it's energetic, it's engaging, and there's meaning and purpose to what you're doing. So all of that, I think those, these are all key lessons that anyone listening can pull out of your experience and, and the examples that you've been providing so that we can make sure um, you know, that our teams in any walk, in any type of organization, you can do these same sorts of things to make sure, sure that people feel engaged, they, they feel empowered, they feel that they have um, the autonomy to, to try things and to create and to innovate, ultimately to bring value to, the to their own work, the team, the organization. And of course, all of that makes the leader look great because then you have a dynamic group of people. I mean, the, the, the best surefire way for you to be successful as a leader is to let go of control, to empower your people, to de help develop them, and then to get out of the way so they can do really cool things. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Couldn't agree more. And I, I think that's exactly, uh, I think you said a couple of things there that are, are especially true in our organization, but, but in terms of when you look holistically at what it takes to, to build a great culture, you know, our, our employees, they love to come to work. They love to spend time with each other. We spend time with each other all the time outside of work. I mean, it's not unusual. We have a, a big open uh, office space here uh, in Lexington and, and around us are bars, restaurants, shops, everything else on site. And so after work, a lot of times you'll see guys uh, and gals taking advantage of happy hours downstairs. You'll see them uh, going out to eat. You'll see them playing uh, recreational sports. You'll see them doing all kinds of stuff. And, and again, it's, it's because the people truly enjoy each other. 
but it's because we've spent that that time and gone that extra mile to get like-minded people to get people that that are are fun and and bubbly and uh and and competitive so that you have uh you know so many similarities but but differences as well right so there's definitely diversity but there's also that uh common set of of principles or or kind of core values that keep everyone together yeah and that's that's important the core values so we started the conversation with why your purpose your values um, once that is there and you have a firm foundation around those values then you can go out and get people to plug in to the system yeah. to to the organization and that doesn't mean like you just said that doesn't mean we're just looking for everyone who's just like us in fact that's really a, a surefire way to set you up for failure so you you seek right. diversity you seek um you know an inclusive workplace environment but you still have connection to the values and when we can yeah. do that then we can leverage the power of diversity difference of background and opinion and mindset and and approach and connect it through the values to help the organization succeed that's right absolutely Good, good. So anything else as, as you're thinking about these past experiences and all the different companies you've been a part of, um, anything else that we haven't already touched on that you'd like to draw out as an example of some of the types of leadership approaches or techniques that you, that have you found to be useful and successful? Yeah, there's. I think that's the biggest kind of misconception. There is no one size fits all approach to leadership right everyone has to do it different everyone draws from experiences that they have within their personal lives or within their uh their professional careers and so a lot of mine came from my background in sports um i grew up i played sports at a, at a very very high level um was always a part of some some really strong teams and when you look at at team building and you look at, at coaching your team can only be as strong as your weakest player Right. And so I think that's where a lot of, of my approach to team building and to um, company and, and culture building comes from is that, you know, we want to bring up uh, whoever our lowest performer is. Right. We want to help them improve. We want to hold them accountable. We want to give them the opportunity to succeed, to build that momentum, to gain that confidence. Um, so that they can go on to do great things and become a better performer, possibly even a high performer, right? But I think at the, the foundation of it all is, is trust, right? You have to have a certain level of trust uh, across your teammates to understand that uh, they're going to hold themselves accountable and that they're going to do what it takes uh, in order to, to raise up the team as well, right? And so I think a, a lot of kind of the lessons that I've learned through athletics, uh, through playing sports at a high level, through coaching. Um, I think those are the things that have really uh, shaped my views on leadership uh, and the way that I, I ultimately work with and interact with, with my teams and my companies. Yeah, that's, that's fantastic. Thank you so much, Patrick. It's just been a real pleasure talking with you, hearing about your experiences, hearing about the, the uniqueness of your approach, um, but also the commonalities of you know, core principles that I think we can try to uh, test out and apply in our organizations. Like you said, there's no one size fits all, but there are common principles that I think can be effective as we, um, as we work within our team. So let's try them out. Let's uh, build trust. Let's create dynamic environments where people feel safe to, to innovate. Let's work on these things. And I think it'll, it'll, uh, be well worth the investment in time and energy on our parts as leaders. Um, this has been a, a fun conversation. Before we wrap up for today, I just wanted to give you a chance to share with listeners how they can get connected with you, find out more about your work, your team, and then give us the final word on the topic for today. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so to connect with me, connect with me on, on anywhere you got social media, Patrick B. Parker. Uh, you can also connect with me at uh, sasspartners.com, S-A-A-S partners uh, dot I-O, actually, sorry. Um, and last word is, uh, is try, uh, try new things. Don't be afraid to experiment, whether that is with leadership, whether that is initiatives, whether that is, uh, processes, policies, et cetera, the, the faster that you can iterate through and that you can try new things, the faster that you'll discover, uh, new ways to unlock levers of growth in your business. Perfect. Well said, Patrick. It's been a pleasure. I encourage listeners to reach out, get connected, find out more about what Patrick and his team can do for you. And as always, I hope everyone can stay healthy and safe, that you can find meaning and purpose at work each and every day. And I hope you all have a great week.